introduce uh, Professor James Cook. He is uh, in charge of the 3D and Extended Media Division of the School of Art at University of Arizona in Tucson. He received his BFA from uh, Berkeley and his MFA from the California College of the Arts. He's exhibited his sculpture and media internationally, nationally, and has participated in numerous residencies, conferences, and symposia all over the world. The United States, Spain, India, Nepal, Japan, and Bulgaria. He has received a number of grants and fellowships, including the Fulbright Regional Research Fellowship in the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia. The Freeman Foundation Fellowship to India and Nepal, and the Asian Cultural Council Fellowship from the Rockefeller Foundation to Japan, and an Arizona Commission for the Arts grant. So I'm pleased to introduce James, um, and I'm really excited to hear about your subject matter. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I really uh, did, in, uh, just as a by way of introduction, uh, I uh, have done a lot of my research uh, in Asia, East Asia, um, for the reason uh, that uh, my work is ontologically based and I subscribe to uh, traditional strategies for the reification, reifying of uh, space, uh, whether it's a condensed uh, kind of iconic space or a temple space, sacral space. And, um, with respect to uh, contemporary artwork, uh, it would be it would entail installation and charging up an installation space. So um, uh, I have had really uh, fairly uh, intense experiences uh, uh, in in India and Nepal, particularly in uh, within the precincts of temples, and uh, and in Japan with no theater. Uh, the uh, time-based uh, kind of experience of uh, the conflation of the phenomenal and the noumenal together within the same uh, uh, in the stage space. And so, uh, and I see uh, ritualization at work in a lot of art, you know, or whether it's consciously done or unconsciously done, it's, it seems to be there. And I guess it could be argued that uh, all art to one degree or another is uh, has ritual some kind of ritualization. So that basically is what I'll be addressing. Uh, is, uh, and I'll start with, um, in a very, rather involved way, although uh, because of the time constraints, it, uh, um, I'm not going to uh, really uh, get into uh, the, the greatest of detail with, re with regard to uh, Hindu temple ritual and the the consecration of icons and temple space, but that is, that'll be the focus, looking at um, how a, a murti is made, uh, how it's generated, and then how it uh, becomes alive within uh, the Hindu tradition. And then we'll look at about um, nine, I believe, uh, contemporary artists, all of whom are well known, and uh, seven of whom are a couple, a couple are uh, beyond the pale. Okay, so this is this is the most recent um, uh, ritual that I've experienced, and we were all there yesterday, so I, I thought I'd introduce uh, this with that image. I, I uh, did you all have uh, kind of an intense experience with this? Mm -hmm. I thought it was fairly uh, powerful as a ritual. Um, and a lot of the uh, the key elements of the ritual, ritualizing that uh, these uh, four uh, men were doing, are uh, can be found as uh, as components to uh, any uh, ritual anywhere. And uh, we'll I'll get into your, uh, get into that. Bit. Okay, so we've used. Um, Images and symbolic touchstones to bridge to the subconscious, the union, collective unconscious, the numinal, and the arc 
cultural mythos and the super consciousness and so on for uh, millennia, forever. And um, uh, because uh, we're going to be talking, uh, you know, not through uh, kind of Neolithic uh, or uh, New Guinea ritual or Native American ritual or, and so on, well, uh, the focus is going to, uh, to be uh, Hindu ritual. And um, uh, what, what ritual does, what icons do uh, in India, as, as elsewhere really, in spiritual traditions, they serve to focus the attention uh, and to, uh, of the mind and to free the consciousness. It's, uh, I'm sure most, most of you have done some kind of uh, mantra or maybe you've tried meditating and basically it's to become very present. And that is the, the end game for any ritual is to find uh, uh, an experience which is precognitive, not rational experience in the present. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. um, and so uh, the, uh, the strategies are to uh, free the consciousness from the external references of the this is a Shiva Nataraj, by the way. And uh, all uh, icons in India are cast solid if they're, uh, if they're for worship. And this <coughs> technically is, is uh, not really easy to do, as, as you all know, because you're all casters. You, know, you uh, do iron, and most of you have probably done bronze. Um, but uh, if it's for worship, it's always cast um, as, uh, as a solid object. And uh, according to uh, this very prominent Indian philosopher, Abhinavagupta, upon encountering the aesthetic object, the spectator worshiper personality is replaced by a focus of identification with the deity archetype. And so that is what happens in, uh, in a Hindu temple. They're not worshiping the other. They're worshiping an archetype, a symbolic uh, uh, sensible uh, configuration of an experience which is a latent experience within us all. And so these, uh, the variety of deities in Hinduism and in Buddhism, you know, Mahayana uh, you know, school of Buddhism, uh, those, uh, that variety of deities uh, are really archetypes, they're various archetypes, and any one of which can be a corridor, a portal, to internal experience, depending on, upon the predilection of the individual. Okay, so um, that's that. Um, uh, this is a, uh, a Kola period bronze, so it's cast uh, uh, around uh, nine, 970 uh, AD, and uh, it's uh, from South India. They have really remarkable bronzes from that period. And so, um, uh, then we have, this is by way of introduction, then we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, contemporary artists uh, who uh, consciously, some consciously incorporate and borrow uh, traditional rit ritual methods to create their own uh, uh, kind of uh, way of working as, and, and these ritual methods are either a substrate as a part of their studio practice, uh, and some, I would say, um, use those met methods to probe ideas uh, ritually and uh, kind of very low-key uh, ritual strategies. Uh, uh, but of course, they're unfettered uh, by a religious canon and or the constraints of traditional models. But they're uh, they're very similar strategies, and they're borrowed to uh, uh, work in the studio. Others. Um, you know, other artists that I know and, and you know as well uh, manifest these uh, ritualizing tendencies in their processing in the studio intuitively. And so it's the result of working and uh, kind of a freeform exploration and uh, focusability uh, through processing uh, uh, develops with some artists. And, and that could be easily regarded as a, a form of kind of a secondary tier ritualization, you know, uh, which bridges to 
uh, more consciously develop ritual icing in the studio in these uh, traditional traditional models. Okay, so uh, this is Marina Abramovic, of course, we all know her work. Um, and, uh, and she's one who uh, quite overtly uses ritual uh, strategies to um, engage the present. She's a, a, a Buddhist practitioner, actually, and uh, I'll talk more about her a little later, but she uh, uh, is into endurance as a way to uh, become more present. She finds that with continuous concentration, which is, is really the strategy for anyone who um, uh, wants to bridge to the noumenal through uh, meditative techniques or concentration techniques, it's continuity in the present. And so she, in her artistic practice, uh, will look at someone for, uh, you know, 14 hours or seven hours, or will uh, look at someone or many, many different people for, as in this piece, the, um, you know, what she did at MoMA uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, she looks at, you know, a, a series of people in the eye. They have, uh, the constraint was that they had to look her in the eye for as long as they were there. And, um, and so she is, uh, fielding uh, a, a myriad of, of portals, you might say, but always with a concentrated stance. And she did that one for three and a half months, every day for seven hours. And so it was uh, tra very it was transformative for her, uh, but it was also uh, because she developed a mojo, you might say, through the practice there. Uh, and it was very highly charged for many who uh, participated in that, in that uh, situation. And this is an Anish Kapoor um, piece, which all of his work is uh, uh, ritually based. And it becomes a site, kind of a sacral site visually. It's secular, but uh, you know, secular is an odd term when you're thinking about uh, what kind of philosophic system or uh, uh, spiritual system is uh, uh, what the experience ultimately is supposed to be or uh, is charged to be. It, it all comes down to experience. And this is James Turrell. Okay, so contemporary art practice, you know, is basically a very open polyvalent state, you know, where the uh, it's kind of a fluctuating zeitgeist, you know, out here in the world. And as you know, if you, those of you who are in grad school or going through grad school and all that, uh, uh, it's, you know, you have all this critical theory floating around and that transitions every five or ten years, it seems. You know, you'll, you'll be reading, uh, you know, uh, you know, Boriot, you know, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and then, you know, it just, continues to transition. And uh, that thinking is very important to uh, kind of examining who we are and what art making is. But ultimately, uh, it's, you know, it's an ever-shifting field. And that tells you something. It, it tells you about the, um, the cultural and so, uh, socio-political uh, flux, for one thing, and the thinking that uh, emanates out of those situations. Uh, but. Uh, you know, I think art making, from my point of view, is best when it's uh, kind of probing its own relevancy and uh, purpose, you know, in this petri dish that we uh, find ourselves in here at an ontological, socio-political level, and uh, environmental level, and all the other issues that we you know, are living with. Um, okay, so I'd, I'd like to first start uh, by considering uh, um, traditional ritual practices, and particularly those associated with uh, temples and the deity icons in South India. Where, you know, I've, I've been several times, and it's been extended period of, periods of time. Did uh, any of you guys get to see um, the Elenis videos? Mm -hmm. I, I shot the, the uh, one around the, the, the temple bell, um, the casting of the temple bell in South India. 
And uh, that was that was kind of an anomaly because I was really uh, there and you know had much more engagement with icon makers, you know, working with waxes and, and uh, the rituals uh, rituals involved with making icons for worship in both India and Nepal. But uh, they were uh, casting this amazingly large bell, and I wanted to uh, see that. Um, okay, so I don't know how much you guys know about Hindu cosmology, but uh, within that cosmology, the supreme consciousness, the self, um, it essentially has no form, a murta, that's the Sanskrit term, and it's not determined by form, it's a rupa, and uh, it's also transformed, it's paro -yuma. and uh, and so it really, in some sense, uh, needs to uh, find form uh, in particular ways, and that would be through a kind of a direct experience or a lineal transmission of uh, ritual consecration to invest particular sites and particular objects with uh, a charge, which it becomes an interlocutor of experience for, uh, for others, for the worshiper. And that, that was just a, you know, a roadside shrine to come everywhere in India. Okay, this is uh, the Lakshmana Temple at Kajraho in, uh, in North India. And, uh, and so over two millennia ago, specialists, uh, you know, this tradition is a long-standing tradition, a couple thousand years. Specialists developed the Stepakas, uh, Stepakas, and the Stapatis. Uh, and they've been the principal agents in the formulation and construction of temples and sites and icons within the Hindu tradition. The stapakas are also called Vishvakarma. If you've uh, read anything about uh, traditional Hindu architecture, uh, that's the term most used, but stapaka is, the, uh, is, is what you would read in uh, traditional canon as a term. Now the stapatis, the traditional artists living today and working today, are called stapat. They're the stapaka and the stapati are kind of one, and they're called stapatis. And so I'm just going to use the term stapati, which is the current term. Okay. So they're specially trained silpies or sculptors, and they are uh, kind of commissioned to be able to do this uh, this sacral work, this more sacred work. Um, and so the Stapatis, uh, this is uh, a studio in Swami Malai in South India. Uh, they create uh, painted images, cast metal icons, carved stone figures, and represent reliefs of deity archetypes. That's what they do. Um, their responsibilities are delineated in a number of these ancient texts, including the Natya Sastras, the Vastu uh, Sutra, the Pansha, the Matsar, the Mayamata, and, and uh, about a half dozen others. And uh, before and during the creation of an icon, uh, these stapadis uh, make, uh, they must make great effort to fully identify with the deity archetype. That's kind of their job. And so they do that in order to, you know, invest more fully in the form, uh, the, uh, the qualities that are uh, material qualities, the form qualities of these attributes, these archetypal attributes. And uh, they do that by, with the use primarily of Guyana slokas. And those are mantras that they re recite constantly to themselves as they're before and during the making of these uh, icons. And so they have to have a detached state of consciousness, what they call sattvic state of consciousness during the formulation of the, of the icons. And, um, and so uh, to really understand icons, I, and because we don't have a great deal of time to get into all the, the intricacies of the ritualization, uh, I, I thought it might be good to uh, have a, uh, to deliver a holistic view. You know, because the icon always lives within a temple precinct and a temple. So we'll talk about temple uh, consecration of temple and how that energy is transmitted into the icon, which is made by the stock. Okay, and. Um, this, uh, these next few slides are, uh, images are uh, temples. And uh, temples are all, always cited auspiciously, both uh, uh, with uh, 
constellar configurations in the right moment astrologically using uh, Indian astrology. And, uh, you know, the, the Tirtha, the place, the holy place, the sacred place, is usually near a river, near water, but they find them in different locations. They're like dowsers, you know, in a way, you know, finding the biggest a-hole in the building in a city in New York, or, you know, something like that. You can, you know, dowsing is, you know, it's just interlocuting through, psychically through a device, you know, a tree or a tree. So, um, uh, these temple, this, this is a South Indian temple complex. This is Tirumanamali in South Central India. And those are much more extensive, they're larger. And these towers that you see on the outside of the walls, the perimeter walls, are called Gopra. And so uh, they become uh, smaller and more concentrated as you go into these uh, South Indian temple complexes. And right in the middle, you see a little dark roof building, and that with a, with a Vimara or a Vimna or a steeple coming out of it, and that is where the icon for worship is. It's in the deepest, dankest, darkest place, central to, to the temple complex, whether it's a single building or a large temple complex. Unlike Gothic cathedrals or the more expansive Western tradition, of, you know, uh, uh, kind of celebrating that kind of upward moment movement and, uh, and alignment that way, it's more concentrated in the end, in the end. And so uh, Garbagria, these sanctum sanctorums that are always dark you know, and really power charged, very charged spaces. Um, okay, so these are these are a couple more temples. This is in Madurai. Uh, this is a Brihadeshvara uh, temple in um, South Central India. It's also known as the This is uh, uh, at Kajarago. These are beautiful small stone temples that were built over the span of about uh, 400 years in the uh, late uh, 850 to about 1120. Okay, and this is how uh, these sites are mapped out. They're really simple, but really they precisely are in alignment with the ideas of Vastu Purusha Manifas. Vastu Purusha is this body form, uh, which is in a particular direction from southwest to northeast. And the various parts of the temple are in alignment with this uh, very simple square designation. You can see I put this uh, kind of mandala form to the, to the right to uh, uh, give you that idea. And tankas, you know about tankas and yantas, uh, and those uh, sacred diagrams are all directionally specific and they're, they're empowered through uh, these geometric, the geometry of, of the configurations and so on. This is another view of it. And, and it's, this is all seen, the Vastu Purusha is always seen as supporting the temple on that on the back. So that it's always face down, actually. <coughs> and it also is in alignment with chakra system in the body, the chakras, the energy, energy systems in the body, with the, uh, uh, the Vimana, you can see on the far left there of the temple, uh, under which is the icon for worship, so in the, uh, in the uh, sanctum sanctum. So all of these things are <coughs> in alignment, it's kind of with the body, with the stars, it's kind of microcosm, macrocosm, and mapped out that way. And this is a you know plan view, like in, you know like kind of a, how we would uh, maybe um, see the building uh, being constructed. There's an elevation drawing and plan view. You, uh, where the leftmost square is, the central cross. Uh, right in the middle is the Sanctum Sanctorum, where the Garbagriya and the icon for worship is, and that's right under this tallest Vimanar steeple. And so you're approaching and approaching and going in and in and in these temples. And then you uh, uh, see the Vigraha, which is the stone icon for worship. All uh, Indian temples have stone icon for icons that they worship as permanent icons. Uh, they, the bronze ones are used only at, at certain times of the year for certain uh, ceremonies. Uh, this is 
Shiva. Again, this is um, a deity archetype in a figural form. And of course, uh, you've probably seen these Shiva lingams and what they are. <coughs> and uh, this is a Shiva Shakti, the male female principle acting together in an abstracted form. A lot, a lot, many of the Shiva temples have these uh, Shiva lingams. So it's, a, it, it's sometimes the art archetype is embodied in a figure, figural way. Way and then other times they are uh, <coughs> abstracted. And this is just to a closer view to uh, where the sanctum is on the left there. And this is how many of the sanctums look if you go find, make your way <coughs> into the innermost part of the temple. They're very dark, oftentimes with oil lamps lighting the way. And, uh, and then beyond here, you can see a, a Morti, a, a stone icon in the rear of the Saint of Saint Form of the Garden. This is another, another one. This one is uh, to Shiva, uh, Vishnu, and uh, is a 12th century temple. There's another. This is at a Lakshmana temple, and this would be uh, Shiva. at the Atinak uh, temple in you know, South Central India. This is also a Shiva. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, you know, then the making of the, uh, the icon. Uh, the, this is a stapati, uh, a traditional murti. Murtis are the icons uh, within the cosmology uh, uh, that demands that the ideal artist, poet, yogi, and aesthete are participants on a higher plane. They've got to cleanse themselves, and they have to ritualize uh, uh, that cleansing with uh, uh, mantram and uh, meditation and uh, these, the recitation of these uh, dialogue slogans. And they uh, view the world in a different way. They're a little more removed if they're doing it well. I, I encountered You know, the thing is, uh, just a sidebar, uh, I, it took me a while to find those who were really the best, the ones who were uh, practicing as they should. And those are the, those are the guys who are uh, commissioned by temples, or in, in, in Nepal, or in um, India, uh, for the Murtis that are going to be worshipped in those temples. And uh, they are few and far between. There are only a handful in South India, really a small handful, three or four. <coughs> and in Nepal, there were maybe a few more, maybe five or six or seven. But uh, they, uh, they're they really special individuals when you meet them. You can feel the, the, like, the difference in the quality of who they are and how they, how they behave. Um, okay. The, uh, this is a, a, a traditional way of measuring the wax. Uh, this this uh, stopity is uh, developing a figure out of beeswax. It's a combination of uh, different materials, which I don't have time to get into, but primarily it's beeswax, which they uh, always have a little coal to soften the wax. They have a pulper softening it and hand it to the stopity to work it. And uh, this is uh, making and you know, rendering a hand. They work basically with wooden tools. And the waxes are very precise and very beautiful. And they're finished. The, and they have this uh, proto ceramic shell process where they, uh, you know, they go to a certain place on the river, on a river bank or in a field, and they pull sand and clay together to, uh, uh, with the right composition, to withstand firing uh, as a mold. And so rather than ceramic shell, and they use riverbank mud and field mud and sand and mix it together. And it, uh, it with a varying results. Some are a really great consistencies. And they also add husks and so on, depending upon the family and the material. But it's uh, what they've been doing for a long, long time. Okay, and then uh, this is looks like uh, you know they have lifters here, but you know they're they're always working. And not with leathers. 
And then you, what they do, they, they carve what they cast. No matter how beautifully the form is cast, they'll go back into it with chisels every single time. They'll carve it so you have the, the wax working person who is usually the master, the father or the senior son, you know, who has the knowledge and has the all all round knowledge. Then you have others in the atelier who are have specializations, and one specialization is uh, metal carving. And so they're they every uh, every millimeter of that which is cast is re carved. They, they can have great detail. And they're always sharpening their chisels. <laughs> go through the metal. Okay, and then, uh, so you can see here that the sandalwood paste on this icon, uh, the eyes haven't been opened. So the artist isn't, that's outside of their domain. And then the Brahmins take over, the priests take over, and they do the eye opening, and they do the consecrations and that ritualization. Okay, the artist is not privy to that, the, but the artist is a part of that development, that formulation. So is that the eyes and the chakras that are covered? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, because those are eyes also, right? They're connections, right? so openings. Okay, and this is a closer view of them. Okay, and so then the uh, consecration of the temple, a new temple or an older temple that needs to be renewed or if there's a new icon for worship, it all goes through the vimana of the temple, the steeple over the sanctum sanctorum. And it's a, it's a complicated process, but basically uh, these uh, priests, or acharyas, are uh, bringing up from the Ganga River, in this case, uh, colossus, or vessels of water, from the Holy River, or any, you know, if they're not near the Ganges, they're somewhere else, and they're, uh, they're finding spring water your water. Then they bring that to a temporary temple site next to the main temple. It's built just for this, pro this ritual process. And uh, there's a fire for five fires for the main primary deity and a single fire for each of the peripheral deity archetypes in the, within the temple. And uh, homas, or uh, these uh, ritual fires, they're yagnas. You've heard, you've heard the term yagna. These uh, yagnas or homas are are uh, uh, how the, these colossus become charged with the Shakti of that particular deity through this ritualization. And then the colossus are brought to the Vimana and are poured over the Vimana and there are silver wires attached to, uh, from the Vimana, from this particular point in the Vimana, down to each of these icons. And uh, through ritualization and this uh, kind of wire, Process, but it, you know that's 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 just a, a form which is uh, used to kind of visualize. It's like an icon in a way for visualization. Uh, there's that conveyance of uh, shakti down into the uh, murtis. Okay, this ritual is called the kumbha abhishekam. Okay, and this is one uh, very large temple where they. Uh, had a thousand eight colossus. A hundred and eight are, are a lot, but this temple had one thousand and eight uh, pots, sanctified pots filled with consecrated water. And these are what the uh, these temporary uh, yagnas or homas look like. And they're uh, different shapes. They're circle, triangle, square, kind of a, a yoni of a heart shape, and a, a hexagonal shape. And so the priests perform the homas uh, in, a, in this temporary uh, temp uh, temple, designated temple area, which is called the Agni Sala. And uh, these are, this is at another temple at uh, how this is being done. And so all these yagnas are being conducted at the same time uh, throughout the, uh, this, the Agni Sala area. And, uh, and then at, while this is happening, uh, the eyes have not been open yet on these icons, so they still have the sandalwood paste on their eyes. And uh, in, 
at a certain point during this process, which goes from three to nine days, this is really when there's a lot of chanting. This really, you know, to be a, a Brahmin priest, there is like a, there's a, an enormous amount of memorization of these uh, Vedic texts and these uh, these uh, cons uh, these cons uh, consecration ritual uh, mantras. Um, and so this is called Abhishekam. Uh, Kumbha Abhishekam is the overall process. Abhishekam is when uh, the deity form, the icons, are bathed, they're cleansed, if you will, with various kinds of liquids, milks and oils, uh, particularly it's coconut water, holly water, curds, and so on. Um, okay. In this uh, next few images, this is a huge Shiva Lingam at the Brihanashwara temple in South India. And uh, I, I uh, was I went into that Bikargarbi. Uh, you're not privy to go into many, but in this temple you can, one can, and it was really vibrating. It was like off the wall, scintillating. I, I was just I didn't know how to get out when I after when I did my circumambulation. It was really a very charged space. <laughs> And uh, this is uh, Hanuman, uh, the, you know, the monkey god in the Ramayana, Hanuman temple, being bathed. And this is um, uh, the Dantareya uh, being bathed with oil. Okay, this is what it looks like on the outside of the Vimana when they, they actually build these wooden scaffolds and they climb up, the priests climb up, and uh, they tie, they fix the colossus to the, to the top of the temple, and uh, as you can see, they're seated around, do more uh, ritualization, more chanting, more mantra. And then, uh, then they, this is another temple, another Vimana. And then they begin pouring very slowly over the spires of each Vimana, uh, this charge of water. And then early in the morning on the final day, uh, the um, uh, the priests will prepare for the prana pratista, which is the eye opening ceremony. Where they, uh, the uh, deity becomes enlivened. They're invited. The deity archetype, that energy, is in some sense invited to inhabit that space, uh, and uh, then the that space is ready for uh, that uh, kind of uh, worship or that kind of uh, participatory. Okay, and this is uh, uh, how one of these stone icons would be dressed. They dress them up and they're, they're very ornate. And this is the actual opening. Usually it's done, this is done behind curtains. But this, uh, this was uh, a, a slightly different situation. You can still see the wire of the cable coming down to the base. It always goes to the base of the uh, figure. So this is the Prana Pratista, and this is when the Shakti or Divine Energy of the Deity Archetype is invited to have the form. Okay, now we, uh, this is, do you recognize these bottles? <laughs> this, is, this is another uh, ritual that we engaged in recently. See, you guys are all, I, I, I'm really enjoying being here for, uh, and, and thinking about ritualization because uh, there's so much ritualization on this land here. You know, that it seems to be, you know, that uh, the, 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 head, the high priest of this land uh, has been, uh, we've been celebrating him, you know, and he's, he's a remarkable individual. And, uh, and to think about the land in the way that he does and how the land is used, it's a kind of a sacral space. And, uh, and things need to be done in the appropriate way at times. I've seen that in how he operates, how he does things. And I think that's really special. And I think, uh, you know, around fire, anybody who's engaged with fire kind of looks at fire a lot, thinks about fire and what that does, and the transformative qualities of fire, the metaphorical qualities of fire in those processes, the transformative abilities. And so it's kind of, it's kind of fun. Okay, um, so anyway, we did this little, little thing. Um, and uh, we'll look at about nine artists, and I'll try to roll through these guys so that we don't go over uh, fairly rapidly. You know these artists, they're all pretty well known. But I, 
I selected them simply because they they really do most of them I think engage in one way or the other in, uh, with ritual. They use ritual a lot. Um, uh, Richard Long, uh, line made by walking. This is uh, you know in all the history books, and uh, you know he um, he's someone who has made all his art really by walking and by leaving these traces. Uh, they are kind of uh, symbolic traces that are gestures. Uh, these marks that are ephemeral marks, some are more, longer lasting than, uh, than others. Uh, and uh, what he says is a walk is just one more layer, a mark laid upon the thousands of other layers of human and geographic history on the surface of the land. And he, see, he has this kind of uh, Robert Smithson view of a very temporal act. You know, he has that uh, kind of epical time frame in his mind as he takes his walk, walks. And he, he's in the present of his walks. And that's what I think traversing does. I, I was reading this New York Times article about walking. We are more creative when we're walking than when we're sitting by 60%. And we're more creative sitting after having walked by 30%. And so walking is very interesting. You know, what it does, the dynamic of going through, traveling through space, but maybe being unfocused, but very focused within in some way. And so that's a ritualization, kind of ritualization. And um, so the place of the walk is, is there before and after the walk. That is his view. He sees it in his traces. And he acknowledges kind of a ritualized process involved in walking, but he doesn't uh, want, he distinguishes himself from any kind of primitivizing tendency with that term. You know, it's kind of a weird term, actually, in the contemporary art world, I guess, but um, it, it happens. And, Wait, uh, which term? Ritualizing, <laughs> ritual, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, uh, but he's, he, he uses walking to induce a highly specific present. That's how he terms it. Highly specific present. Here's another. This is in Scotland. In the High Islands. And we all know this person, Anna Mendieta. She did the Tree of Life uh, series and the Silhouette series in the 70s. She was a very early uh, and uh, feminist artist. Uh, important to that movement. I don't think she saw herself as a feminist artist, but she was embraced. You know, all these movements kind of pull uh, the historians and institutions and theoreticians pull artists into movements, but at any rate, she, uh, uh, she was very important in, uh, in terms of catalyzing uh, the feminist movement in the 70s. And, uh, you know, she generally, it's a, her work is generally an expression of the uh, kind of body birth identification and references her own resurrection and her life history, uh, uh, kind of mythical, personal, uh, transformations and uh, historic and also in a historical political sense. She was uh, uh, from Cuba. And uh, her early work is marked by preoccupation with blood, violence, fertility, and uh, the uh, ritually reiterated image is based upon her own figure and also in the form of the Etruscan goddess and uh, with the arms sometimes raised in the incantatory gesture. Uh, also, they're sites, they're cited. They're like these uh, tirtas in the Hindu tradition, these sacral places. She'll cite this figure in a particular place. This seemed to be the right place for this particular iteration of her own figure, cutting it in, into the earth or molding of the soil and so on. <coughs> this is simply uh, <coughs> like that line walking made by Richard Long. This is lying in grass. This looks quite simple. Then we have uh, uh, someone who's very influential globally in the art world, particularly with European artists in the uh, 70s, 80s, and 90s. He had held sway for a long time, Joseph Boyce. This is his bat chair, uh, an early object piece. Uh, and you know, he, as again we know, but I'll kind of go over this a little bit, he developed a very personal uh, symbolic language. Uh, uh, consisting both of actions, performances, ritual performances, shamanistic performances, and um, um, 
kind of materials that are drawn from alchemy, shamanism, and his own personal experiences where he felt that particular materials uh, had an energy that he could use performatively or ritually to uh, uh, induce an experience in the uh, with the, uh, the spectator audience uh, space. And felt he used a lot, that he used a lot, copper and uh, various other materials. Okay, and for, uh, uh, they were viewed as, uh, for, uh, with, uh, in the eyes of boys, as having a kind of a therapeutic value uh, for uh, himself and for the, for the viewer. Fat, for instance, um, uh, was used to signify chaos and the potential for spiritual transcendence. And it is due to the valency, the valence of fat as a solid potential energy and then the, uh, the fat which is liquid. And you know, that it has that kind of uh, multivalence uh, potential for energy and stored energy. And so putting it in a chair, he says, uh, I placed it on the chair to emphasize uh, this uh, potential of energy. Uh, since the chair represents a kind of human anatomy, and uh, the area of the digestive and excretive warmth processes, uh, sexual organs, and interesting chemical change in that area related to uh, uh, psychologically to willpower. You know, so it's pretty complicated for a little wedge of fat in a chair. You know, but that's how he was thinking about these things, and that thinking invests itself in in, in work. Um, I have a Japanese friend, Yoshi Saito, who lives and works in Denver, who uh, cast, sometimes, when we went to grad school together, and he would cast objects solid, because no one would ever know it, but he said, it, it needs to be solid. I know it's, I know it's solid. And that was, you know, it's, you just, it, and so you're investing, it's an investment, which is, is a charge, which is there. Okay, and then uh, this is a well-known image of uh, a performance he did at a drawing show he had in Dusseldorf, where he locked out the uh, audience in the opening night, and he uh, would, he wandered around the studio uh, explaining his drawings to his dead hair as he walked out. And um, basically for him, he, is, he explained his performance in this way. I have been putting honey on my head I'm clear, clear, clearly doing something that has to do with thinking. Human ability is not to produce honey, but to think, to produce ideas. In this way, the death-like character of thinking, rational thinking, uh, becomes life-like again. For honey is undoubtedly a living substance. Human thinking can be lively too, but it can also be intellectualized to a deadly degree and remain dead, and express its deadliness in, say, the political and pedagogical fields. Teach, I teach. <laughs> Okay, so um, and so it, it becomes a kind of a shamanistic, ritualized, performative gesture, which has potency uh, because he's distilling the actions in a particular way. He's using a, a particular materials in the to uh, reify those actions, to invest in those actions. Here he's doing a, a very interesting bog action, uh, and this was in the Zuido Z area in Holland, where uh, they were attempting to save marshes uh, from development, you know, making more land, and um, and so he crawled into the marsh, and he he uh, waded and he swam, and he talked to the, he kind of muttered in little incantations to the plants and and. Uh, and he did that for hours, and then he came out of it. it was, uh, that, that was his action. That was his art. Okay, and his um, best-known ritualistic action took place in uh, in uh, New York City, and it's called "I Like America, America Likes Me." We, again, we all know about this, but it's so interesting because. You know, he basically spent uh, three days in a room with a coyote, and for him, the coyote represented uh, America, 
uh, before the incursion of uh, the Euro incursion, right? And, uh, and so he was swabbed and felt. He was uh, he went from the he didn't he never touched America. He was carried by gurney up into the gallery. He lived he cohabitated with this coyote with some Wall Street journals. And the coyote every day they were renewed with 50 copies of Wall Street Journal. A coyote would urinate on him, like him every day. And he'd be taken away, and um, he. But he wanted he wanted to isolate himself, insulate himself, see nothing of America but the coyote, which is why he ritually uh, performed in that way. And um, and for you know Native Americans, the coyote, coyote is a powerful uh, kind of uh, demigod uh, status in some some Native American cultures, uh, with the power to move between the physical. And the uh, spiritual world, and uh, and it seemed like a pest after the incursion of, uh, of uh, you know from across the Atlantic, and so um, uh, he wanted to kind of rehabilitate uh, that situation, which is what this is about. It's a healing process, a shamanistic act on the part of the boys, remedial, psychically to remediate some of the wounds. Uh, this is a, a, a Wolfgang Leib. Do you know his work? He's done he's done um, uh, a lot of work with pollen and milk, and uh, he um, just to because we're running we're getting really close here. Uh, he grows his pollen on uh, his farm in Germany. You know they they come from various sources, um, uh, pine trees and other plants, and he harvests. Uh, the pollen, and then he will do this. Uh, this is milk and marble, what we're seeing here, and that's a one one of his uh, interfaces. The, and he sees milk to be, uh, you know, it's a it's an animal product. It's ephemeral. It's nurturing. And then marble is stone. It's stasis. It's uh, it goes beyond that kind of ephemeral time uh, quality in terms of how we experience it. And so it's that. The interface and the renewal that is required each day to clean the plate, if you will, the stone, and then renew with more milk so that the viscosity of the milk, the kind of uh, surface tension reaches the edges and you don't really discern between, if you've seen any of his work, these milk stone pieces, you don't know that it's marble or it's milk. You, they are unified, that they're once liquid and once stone. So really um, and this is uh, how he's laying out his pollen and he's uh, uh, creating these grids. He's picking, uh, harvesting pollen here in one of the fields uh, from hazelnut, dandelion, buttercups, and moss pollens in the fields surrounding his home. And then he uh, lays very carefully, sifts it out onto these gallery floors. And so it's kind of a quasi-magical hunter-gatherer richness that stands in with his work. You know, if you, it's very slow. And uh, the pollen that pops from the floor, it's like a, uh, a remarkable Rothko on the floor, but it has a presence that uh, is like this Tirta zone. Only it's not site specific, he creates a site within the museum space or the gallery space. He's creating his own site, which is very, has a kind of power. This is at MoMA, a couple years ago. And uh, he, he's also generated these wax rooms. There's one at the uh, Metropolitan in, uh, in New York City, and this one's at the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C. And this is another in uh, uh, Sperling, uh, Switzerland. Okay, and I think we're, uh, we're really close. I had more artists, but I'll just stop here. This is, well, this is a really different guy, though. This is... Uh, <laughs> Uh, this well anyway I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, this this guy uh, Teaching Sia uh, does year long projects as an artist. Do you know his work? He's uh, this he secluded himself. Huh? Was he homeless for a year? Yes, uh, he lived he lived outside, unco unsheltered for a year. He lived for a year um, in a room which was caged in. Uh, he also lived for a year clocking, punching a time clock on the hour, 24 hours a day. So the, that kind of existential probing, you know, why am I alive? What is this? 
uh, it's, it's, it, because he's an existential character, actually. He's, he's really, he has, he, he's probing his own issues with, with these acts. But they're highly ritualized. This is when he's living outside. Okay, so we'll, we'll stop there. Are there any, are there any questions or comments or anything? Well, I just thought it was sort of interesting because I think of the notes I took, you know, you know, talking about the identification to a deity, and if we were just talking about earlier this morning sort of creating that familiarity. Um, so the reference to identification to a deity equaling um, sort of pop art, how pop art was successful referencing that familiarity, but taking the religious quotient out of it, that it actually does exactly the same thing. Um, I find it intriguing. Yeah, I think, uh, I call it secular uh, ritualization. I, I, I think many artists have methods that are concentrated, uh, part of it helps to concentrate the process in the studio to uh, uh, yield as a net result a, concent uh, a, a kind of a transformative perception shifting psychologically uh, Kind of opening type of experience. And a ritual must have uh, some kind of transformative um, uh, intention, intentionality, I think. And I think uh, many contemporary artists work um, uh, intuitively in a ritualistic way. I think so. You know, we were, you know, that sort of expands that conversation about talking and about casting and sort of that labor intensity allows you to create sort of this ritualistic process with yourself and then that time that you actually spend with the material charges the work because you've transferred your energy through that sort of process to yeah, the work. You're, you're describing how you get into a zone uh, which Somewhere. is, yeah, and I think we all get, get it, probably get into those zones. I mean, those are, that's, Very that's similar to this whole process in a way, <laughs> you know, take away the, the religion from it. During the casting process for Idols, did the founders go through any rituals during that stage of virtual melting process? Uh, yeah, there. Uh, yeah, the all of all of the uh, work in, in a in a good atelier. All of the workers are actually doing uh, mantra to the uh, to the deity archetype and are uh, are. are divorcing themselves from external uh, attachments to the extent that they can in their lives. Most are, nearly all are householders, you know, which makes it uh, more difficult, uh, but uh, uh, they don't do it to the degree, nearly to the, the degree that the uh, stopping does, but they, but they are uh, supposed to be doing it. And many, and many do in, in some, in, in within, as I said, there are only a handful of in those ateliers. They're all you can you can feel the conscious presence of the individuals and how they're working as a, in a kind of a communitas way, in a very conscious way around this, this process. Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah, yeah, it's a yes and no. In some places, yes, in other places, no. Well, thanks so much, Jim. I think if uh, people have more questions, you can meet uh, James out in the hallway because we have now a presentation on uh, reaction welding starting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs>